the MMA the fortune MMA teller. Fortune. The teller. The teller. The teller. The teller. The teller. The teller. The teller is back. We got UFC 249 taking place April 18th. And boy, do we have a stacked card. Uh, the teller is extremely excited for this card. Um, you know, this is one of the most stacked cards we've had in a long time. But not to mention the circumstances that this card comes in on. You know, we've, we hadn't had fights in, what, over a month? Um, not to mention not just having fights. We haven't had any sports to even watch. No baseball, no basketball, no football, no hockey. Uh, you know, n- no real sports to watch, no sports to bet on. And then, boom, in comes UFC 249, one of the most extremely stacked cards. You guys can just feel the energy. Imagine how you're going to feel fight night, April 18th. You know, sitting on the couch right in front of the TV, uh, it's going to be an amazing night. So, uh, you know, th- this is the official breakdown video for UFC 249. Don't let the other fools fool you. The teller is here. And let's not forget what the teller was doing leading up to UFC 249. We did have that that break in time from fights, but let's not forget the teller won 10 of his 11 previous bets leading up to UFC 249. I've been on an absolute tear um, you know, for those of you guys that remember the last card we had taking place in Brazil, went two for three on the night. The only play I lost was the Juicier Formiga, but uh, hit the Gilbert Burns big and then hit the underdog play in Charles Oliveira. So the teller still working his magic. Nothing's changed over here. You know, in fact, leading up to UFC 249, I've had nothing but time to break down these fights. And I think that this card gives us a lot of opportunity to make some money. So we're coming in on fire right now. So let's get that straight first and foremost. Now to the card. I mean, look at this card, top to bottom. I mean, first off, the main event, I got to start there. Tony Ferguson taking on Justin Gaethje. I know it's not the fight that we all initially wanted. It's not the Khabib Nurmagomedov versus Tony Ferguson fight. That will eventually happen, you guys. Just hang tight, you know, be safe out there, you know, and, and eventually we will see this fight happen. Mark my words, it might be in 2021 or whatever, but the fight has to happen. Um, so, you know, hopefully Tony Ferguson pulls the fight off and then that will be the next fight lined up. Uh, but we'll get into that fight here in a little bit. Uh, but you know, Jessica Andrade, Rose Nama Yunus, re- the rematch. That's an amazing fight. How about Francis Ngannou versus Rosenstruck on the prelims? I mean, what an amazing fight. I mean, we got interesting fights even, you know, towards the bottom of the card. Jacare Souza versus Uriah Hall. Very interesting matchup. Uh, and, and, you know, we're going to be getting into detail on into all these fights here in a minute. So, um, you know, what else is there to talk about? You know, uh, first and foremost, before I do get into the into the breakdowns of these fights, I want to say again, you guys make sure you guys are all safe out there. The tellers, you know, thoughts and prayers are with all you guys. You know, we're a family out here. You know, we're a tight knit community, the MMA betting community, the MMA community. And, um, you know, my thoughts are with all you guys. So make sure you're taking this serious. Uh, you know, you don't ever want to put yourself in a compromising position by, you know, underestimating your opponent, you know, or, or the, your threat. And you guys know how that goes, man. You know, it, it transpires from from life to the fight game. You, you don't want to underestimate your opponent. So you guys be safe out there. And, uh, you know, we got many of events and fights to watch in our, our beautiful long life. So with that being said, I think it's time to get to UFC 249. Okay, now, so let's all remember... Moving forward for, for the, the present time, there will be no fans in attendance. There will, no, will, there will not really be a hometown edge uh, for, for particular fighters. I mean, there could be to a minimal extent, you know, if one fighter didn't have to travel as much. Um, but the location, at least as of now, April 8th, has not been announced. Um, I believe this, this fight will be taking place on the West Coast. I heard Joe Rogan's going to be commentating on the event, so that makes me assume that it's on the west coast because i don't think that joe rogan's traveling um you know i I feel like i know joe rogan pretty good listening to him almost on a daily basis and the way that he he works so i don't think he'll be traveling far so i think this event will be taking place in the west coast i could be wrong i know eventually we will be having some fights uh be taking place on a private island that dana white's been talking about in my opinion that's going to be not far from me i think that's going to be in the bahamas that's my strong opinion so um Stay tuned to see if I was correct on that, but I think it will be taking place uh, off the, sh- the coast of, of Florida, South Florida. So, um, you know, there's some, there's a couple things that lead me to believe that, um, you know, I can go into detail more, but, you know, we'll, we'll make another video about that. I think it's about that time we start breaking down these fights, uh, but I just wanted to say, you know, keep that in mind now. 
uh, you know, when we look into these fights, these fights are going to be fought just, you know, similar, similarly to the Ultimate Fighter house type of fights. You know, it's going to be quiet in there. There's going to be very limited amount of coaches in there. And uh, it's going to be whoever is the better fighter is going to win the fight. So uh, keep that in mind. And with that being said, let's get right into this card. So in the first fight of the card, we got smiling Sam Alvey taking on Ryan Spawn. And, uh, you know, Sam Alvey's coming into this fight on a three-fight losing skid. I think if he loses this fight, it might be time for him to hang it up. And quite honestly, I, I see him losing this fight. Uh, you know, Sam Alvey, you know, as of the last couple of years, has decided that he doesn't even want to make the weight cut to middleweight where he should be fighting. You know, he's only 33 years old, so it's not like he's that old. Um, but I think he's just had one one foot out the door for quite some time. He's just collecting paychecks. Uh, he was able to brand himself and make a name with that whole smiling type thing that he does. And, you know, he's not the most physically opposing, imposing fighter, but he was getting a lot of counter knockouts. People tended to gravitate towards him. I've seen him fight live in Orlando. I saw him knock out this Russian dude, um, you know, and I've been watching him for a long time uh, before he's ever even stepped foot into the octagon. So uh, Sam Alvey, you know, a Team Quest guy, you know, he's, he's, he's trained with the best of them, very crafty fighter. Um, but, you know, you, you take a look at his last three fights, and in my opinion, he was just completely outclassed by these guys. Um, you know, got knocked out by uh, Antonio Rogerio Noguera. Jimmy Crute finished him. And then Clidson Abreu also finished him. You know, the Jimmy Crute fight, he tried to, you know, contest the stoppage, but he, he was in, in no shape or form in, in, in that fight. He wasn't going to win that fight in the least bit, and he was done. Um, so, you know, but, you know, he's, he showed once again that he's an intelligent guy and he tried to come off like that was a bad stoppage. Um, he just, in no shape or form will he ever beat Jimmy Crute in, inside of a cage or inside of any type of fight. So, um, and then now we look over at his opponent, Ryan Spawn. This is a guy that I feel is a very talented fighter, 17 and five, and, uh, it's been just absolutely running through people as of recently. Just, uh, you know, finished Devin Clark with that nasty guillotine. Uh, before that, finished Antonio Rogerio Nogueira with that nasty uppercut. Um, you know, this guy's a fight finisher. This is, a, you know, an LFA veteran, a guy that's been putting in work for quite some time. You, you take a look at the guys that he's lost to, you know, some, some pretty, you know, talented fighters. You know, Robert Drysdale, for those of you guys that know him, one of the best jujitsu practitioners out there, who was also taking steroids at the time. Uh, just a nasty dude. So, you know, he got finished by him, got submitted. No real shame in that. Uh, Robert Drysdale on, on the juice. That guy's a nasty fighter. Uh, Carl Robertson also got the finishing him. Carl Robertson is a very talented fighter. Then he had that split decision loss to Trevin Giles. Trevin Giles, you know, he, he's inside the UFC right now and he's, he's trying to... Uh, trying to maintain fighting in the UFC, but he's a talented fighter. But um, so as I said, though, since then, Ryan Spawn just went on a tear, took out guys like Alex Nicholson, Louis, uh, Luis Enrique, Antonio Rogerio Noguera, and Devin Clark. Um, you know, Spawn is big for the weight class, you know, six foot five, 81 and a half inch reach. The striking's there, um, you know, training at Fortis MMA, he's, he's rounding his, his grappling and his overall skill set. And uh, I just, you know, he's 28 years old. I think that this is more simple than you guys think. You don't want to overlook uh, this fight too much. I think that Spawn is just more athletic. He's a more talented fighter. He, he's more in his prime. And, you know, going back to what I stated in the beginning, Sam Alvey's just on his way out. You know, he's very inactive inside the octagon. So as far as Sam Alvey winning a decision, it's very unlikely for, with the amount of strikes that he's going to throw. I don't see Sam Alvey taking Spawn down, Spawn down and doing any type of ground and pound or submission uh, finish on him. You know, Alvey's going to circle. He's going to backpedal. And he's going to look for the counter punch. The only way that Alvey wins this fight, in my opinion, is if he gets that counter punch and knocks Spawn out. I don't see it happening. Uh, Spawn could be a potential uh, parlay leg or whatnot. You know, you're going to get him around my, uh, what? I mean, the lines already jumped ridiculously just in the last day. Uh, you know, now he's a minus 360. You could have got him at minus 270 as of yesterday. So, you know, you got to be on top of these things. And, um, yeah, Ryan Spahn's going to get that fight. Yeah, he's going to win that fight. Sajara Eubanks taking on Sarah Maras. Uh, this is, a, you know, an interesting matchup. A little bit of a lower level women's mixed martial arts. Um, but, you know, a lot of people like to watch Sarah Maras. Uh, fight inside the octagon. At least some do, you know. She, she gets the name Cheesecake for a reason, if you guys catch my drift. And, uh, you know, Sajara Eubanks, this is a girl, you know, lost her last two fights. Uh, she lost her last two fights. And um, in my opinion, this is a girl, 
you know, she did her thing in the Ultimate Fighter house, that's for sure. You know, she won a lot of bouts in there. Um, but, you know, since then, has really not looked that good. Um, she did take out Lauren Murphy and Roxanne Matafari. But uh, since then, lost to Aspen Ladd and Betch Correa, which she did not look good in that Betchy fight. She came in as the extensive favorite, and I, I thought it was a little ridiculous, um, you know, based on the type of matchup that it is, you know, women at this weight and with, with their type of level of skills, you know, anything could happen in there. But she was an extensive favorite, and a lot of people lost money in, in that spot there. Um, but, you know, you know, Sarge, from my, in my opinion, what she does a lot, man, she's kind of boring. She's kind of meat and potatoes. People think that she's better than she is uh, for the reason I said, you know, she did good in the Ultimate Fighter House, and she kind of looks... Like, uh, kind of looks like a dude a little bit. And people tend to think that since she looks like a guy, she's going to fight like a guy, but she just doesn't. And, um, you know, she kind of has that athletic type of look. She looks like she could be a, a defensive back in the NFL, but uh, that's not really what you get, you know, when you watch her inside the octagon. So, um, you know, if she loses this fight, that's three in a row. Um, but, you know, Sarah Moras, on the other hand, this is a girl that is uh, extremely unathletic, um, has very underrated Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Her jiu-jitsu is good. She's good off her back. She's very flexible. She could snap an arm bar on you very quickly. Uh, she could throw a triangle up there and, and whatnot. She's very, you know, she's very uh, underrated on off her back. So she's not one to be underestimated because you can be dominating the fight and then, you know, she could ruin your night very easily. Um, you know, she's coming off uh, a pretty pretty impressive victory off uh, Liana jo Jojua, where she uh, she had some nasty ground and pound. That was a fight that she looked very good in. She did. She looked very good in that fight. She absolutely dominated that fight, uh, got the finish in the third round. So, um, But, you know, before that, it's been very ugly for her. Uh, she only won two of her, her prior seven fights before finally pulling off that victory against Liana. Um but, you know, Sarah Maras, like I said, uh, you know, she's a girl, you know, you might want to tune in and uh, and watch fight. But um, I, I would tend to feel that she's going to lose this fight. I think that Sajara can, as long as she can avoid that submission, I think that Sarge can do enough to, to win the striking battle, you know, when the fight takes place in the feet. And uh, I could see Sarge doing enough to avoid the submission. She has decent grappling. You know, she participates in a lot of Brazilian jiu-jitsu tournaments and whatnot. She takes her jiu-jitsu seriously. Uh, she's trained very well in that in that aspect of her fight game. So I, I think her jiu-jitsu defense will be enough to avoid that submission, and she'll probably end up winning uh, the unanimous decision. Up next, we got Michael, the menace, Johnson taking on Kama Worthy. Uh, this fight was actually announced a little bit later than the, the rest of the card. And I think this is a, a nice little fight that they threw in here, an entertaining fight. I think somebody's going to get knocked out here. Both of these guys bring it. Uh, they like to strike. And um, this should be a, a true treat here. So don't sleep on this fight because uh, I think somebody will be sleeping in this fight. Uh, you know, Michael Johnson, cool dude, man. I just saw him a couple months ago. Saw him at the local bar. You know, he, I guess he's, he's over here around my way. He trains at Hard Knocks 365. Um, you know, I've brushed shoulders with this guy quite a few times. I've seen him around the way a couple times, actually. And uh, I always tell you guys uh, an interesting story, you know, whenever he's fighting, you know, sitting right behind his brother, you know, chopping it up with his brother the entire fight when he was fighting Nate Diaz. And his brother ended up getting in a brawl as soon as they announced um, the decision in that fight, man. I'm telling you, I had it on my old phone. I'm going to try to pull that video up. He told me he was going to brawl it out with these guys. They were talking shit the entire time. Once Buffer said the winner is Nate Diaz, his brother ran down there, started brawling with these guys, man. Ended up getting handcuffed, dragged out the arena. Uh, you know, it's funny too. I even talked to Michael Johnson about it on Instagram and then his brother ended up shooting me a DM. Uh, we were laughing about it. So, uh, man, these guys are wild dudes, man. These guys can fight. Now, as far, as far as inside the octagon, let's not forget, you know, some of the, the things that Michael Johnson's accomplished, man. This guy's been locked in there with some of the best fighters, man. Justin Gaethje, Dustin Poirier, you know, a lot of Tony Ferguson, uh, you know, has a victory against Tony Ferguson. Let's not forget these things. Um, of course, you know, Michael Johnson, not the most reliable fighter. Um, you know, he, he does tend to lose a lot. And especially as of recently, you know, he's only won three of his last, uh, what, 10 fights, but you know, this guy can, he can defeat anybody any given night though. That's the thing with him. You know, you saw what he did to Dustin Poirier, one of the nastiest knockouts you'll ever see. Um, I do feel that Dustin played that fight completely wrong. He should have took his time. He got emotional in there and he rushed the fight and got slept. Uh, I think Dustin Poirier wins that fight nine out of 10 times, but that was the, uh, the 10th time where Poirier dropped the ball. So, 
Um, you know, the Nate Diaz fight was a little bit closer than some people thought. Um, but, you know, as of recently, let's look at what he's done. You know, he he blew that Stevie Ray fight, got taken down and controlled uh, when he was, you know, he started off good in that fight and he was winning the fight, ended up dropping the ball in that fight, got slept by Josh Emmett before that. And then you look at his two wins before that against Artem Lobov and Andre Feely. The Feely fight was very close as well. So, um but, you know, here's the thing. This fight is going to take place on the feet. It's going to be a, a striking war. Michael Johnson has very quick hands. Unor you know, he's very unorthodox. He has that southpaw style. Um, it's very tricky for a lot of fighters. Uh, and then we take a look at Kama Worthy. Kama Worthy, 15-6. and six, Came in to his last fight against Devontae Smith as a heavy underdog and ended up getting the finish in the first round and showed to have some nasty power in his hands. Caught Devontae Smith with a nasty left hook. And um, so this guy can put anybody out. You know, I, I don't think that this guy has, uh, has been through the ringer as much as Michael Johnson. So the mild, mileage isn't as bad on him. The chin should hold up a little bit be better, in my opinion. Um, but, you know, if I got to pick somebody to win, I think that this fight's a lot closer than the line says. Michael Johnson at a minus 240 is a little high, uh, maybe even a lot of high. I think this fight, it's, it's going to be a brawl and somebody's going to get knocked out. So... Uh, you know, I slightly edge Michael Johnson to win the fight. The line is off, though. The value has to be on Kama Worthy. You know, I'll tell you guys, I'm really enjoying breaking down this card. Um, you know, it kind of reminds me of the old days when the cards were a lot more spread apart and you would look more forward to the event and would, there would be bigger names on the card. Um, comment below. What do you guys think? Do you guys like... Uh, and I'm not saying particularly the, the setup that it is right now or the way that, that we're going into this card. It doesn't have to be a month apart. But uh, do you guys like having fight cards every single weekend? Or do you guys kind of enjoy maybe every other weekend? Um, a little bit more of a break in between where you kind of, at least I'm feeling like, you kind of look forward to this uh, these events more. You get more excited for these fights. Um, comment below. I'm curious what you guys think. Do you guys like the cards to take place every single weekend? Or do you feel like that kind of dilutes and water down, waters down uh, these events? I'm curious what you guys think, but... Uh, you know, nevertheless, on to the next fight. Marlon Chito Vera taking on Ray Borg. This is a solid matchup here. Ray Borg, as you guys know, um, you know, a very, very skilled fighter, you know, coming up to bantamweight once again. Uh, you know, obviously, he's put some time down at flyweight. He's fought for the belt and whatnot. And, um, you know, not the biggest bantamweight fighter. He's going to be fight stepping into this fight uh, with a four inch height disadvantage and, uh, what, about a seven and a half inch reach at disadvantage so uh, this might be a tough fight for him man and i'm high on marlon chito vera this guy continues to get finishes every time he steps in there um, you know I, i've been actually following marlon marlon through this whole thing that we've had going on over the last month been watching a lot of his live instagram videos been watching how he's been training uh and you could tell that this guy knew that he was going to be fighting soon um and, and i expect marlon not to miss a beat Stepping in there, coming off a very impressive victory against Andre Ewell. Got the ground and pound finish in the third round. You know, uh, choked out that guy, Nolan Hernandez, in the second round before that. Finished Frankie Sines before that in the first round. Uh, finished Guido Canetti in the second round with the rear naked choke. Finished Ouija Buran in the, with body punches in the second round. I mean, this guy has just been running through people like a buzzsaw. That's five fights in a row that he's won and he's finished his opponent. Um, you know, then he had the two losses before that against Douglas Andrade and John Lineker, two very talented fighters, um, you know, but but going into that and in those two fights, you know, Marlon, in my opinion, wasn't as polished, obviously, you know, a lot, uh, he was a lot younger, um, you know, but this is a guy that's taken out guys like Brian Kelleher, Brad Pickett, uh, of course, that Brad Pickett fight, in my opinion, is really where he, he put his name on the map, you know, everyone was expecting Brad Pickett to win that fight, that was Brad Pickett's retirement fight, I believe the fight took place uh, over across the pond in Brad Pickett's uh, home of the wood, you know, neck of the woods, it was supposed to be, uh, you know, uh, a sayonara, he was supposed to get the victory, and Marlon Chito Vera ended up finishing him uh, with a nasty head kick, so yeah, you know, since then, he's just, he's gone to work. So uh, I'm very high on Marlon Chito Vera. Uh, I think that this is his fight to win. I think that he just has such a size advantage. I, I kind of think that Ray Borg should be fighting down at the flyweight division. Um, you know, some aspects I do like uh, about Ray Borg moving up to bantamweight. You know, he 
even has more of a gas tank than he even had a flyweight, which he already had an extensive gas tank and, and great output. Um, you know, he's a, a very tenacious fighter. You know, Ray Borg's coming in here as the favorite. And um, I was a little bit surprised to see that. I thought that Marlon Chito Vera would come in as the favorite or it would be a very close fight, maybe a pick em. So, you know, Ray Borg's around minus 145 right now. And uh, you can get Chito Vera around plus 115. I just think that Vera's going to use... Uh, his size and his reach advantage. He should stay on the outside, use his, his very skilled striking to pull this fight off. He can't let Ray Borg get on the inside and make this a, a grappling uh, affair. You know, if he does that, it could be a long night for Chito Vera. Maybe Ray Borg put, pushes a pace on him that Chito's not ready for. And, um, you know, but hopefully Vera's coming in in shape. And, you know, one thing that we have to take into consideration too is, you know, Vera might not have been, he, he may not have been getting the proper grappling training obviously with this whole thing going on you know he hasn't had the the partners to grapple with that could be uh, something to look into um you know maybe a reason to stay away from this fight um but you know if things are all normal and these guys have a an even playing field i would say that vera would pull this fight off but uh, one thing to to keep an eye on you know hopefully vera will be able to keep up with the pace and the grappling of ray borg because ray borg has been grappling at a higher level for uh, you know uh, a way longer period of time from a, a younger age. So, but I'm still gonna go at Marlon Vera to pull the fight off. Alexander the Great Hernandez taking on Omar Morales. This is an excellent matchup. Uh, don't sleep on this guy Omar Morales. If you guys don't know about him, this guy's a very skilled fighter, training at a Hard Knocks 365. The Venezuelan fighter. He's nine and zero undefeated. Um, obviously made his debut on Dana White's Contender Series, and um. Really made a statement, got the finish in there, and uh, you know he's a big fighter, man. He's uh, you know has a nice seventy four inch reach for the weight class. You know he's uh, he has a, he has a nice frame, nice and athletic, and uh, he's going to come into this fight against Alexander Hernandez with the two inch reach advantage and the one inch height advantage. So maybe not as much as as some of you guys would think. You know Alexander Hernandez, you would think he'd be the more stocky fighter in there, but uh, I guess it is a little bit closer than you would think. But uh, you know Alexander Hernandez. Uh, let's talk about this guy for a minute. You know, he comes, makes his debut inside the octagon against Benil Dariush. Of course, you guys remember that. Gets the, the early knockout, uh, really makes a name for himself. Um, but, you know, ever since then, I don't know. I, I really haven't liked what I've saw, what I've seen. You know, the OAM fight, kind of a lackluster, lackluster affair. Didn't really look too impressive in that fight. Then the Cowboy Cerrone fight. Cowboy Cerrone shuts the mouth of Alexander Hernandez. Hernandez was talking all types of shit. He was cocky in there, cocky in there. He disrespected Cowboy, and Cowboy made him pay for it. Uh, for those of you guys that remember that fight, or if you haven't, if you don't remember it and you haven't seen it recently, run that tape back. Cerrone brutalized Hernandez in there, um, you know, and he got the finish in the second round. It was nasty. Uh, then you take a look at his last fight against Francisco Trinaldo. I I've talked about this fight time and time again, and I'll always say it for what it was. It was a complete robbery, an absolute complete robbery. Um, the fight did take place in Hernandez's uh, hometown or whatnot. You know, he had a big, a big crowd out there rooting for him and they absolutely robbed Francisco Trinaldo. Uh, Hernandez probably threw like three significant strikes the entire bout and they gave him the fight. So one of the craziest decisions I've ever seen. So as far as I'm concerned, he's on a two-fight losing skid. The OAM fight did not look that good. He kind of gassed out in the later rounds. Um, it kind of leads me to think that that Benil Dariush knockout really overvalued and overhyped him. So, you know, him stepping into this fight against Omar Morales. Omar Morales is a guy that I know is a very well-rounded fighter with some nasty striking uh, training over at Hard Knocks 365. You know, you run the tape and you, and you see that this guy is a very talented fighter. He's 34 years old, but doesn't have a lot of mileage on him. You know, he, he's only had nine professional fights. I think he got into the game a little bit late and, um, and he's a skilled fighter. So uh, I don't expect his age to be too much of a factor. The guy's in excellent shape. And, uh, you know, you take a look at the line. Omar Morales is almost a two to one underdog. Uh, I think that's that's ridiculous. Uh, another fight that I'm going to say the value is on the dog. And you know what? I'm going to pick the dog here too. Omar Morales to win the fight. I pick Omar Morales. I think that his striking is better than Hernandez's. Hernandez's striking is very is very bulky. You know, you could see it in his frame. He's like a power lifter, and he's not that he's not that fluid on his feet. Um, if, if Hernandez can make this a grappling affair, maybe he can get some takedowns and he could smother Morales. I think that's the way that he would win the fight. I think he would expose Morales' grappling. And again, 
uh, we have to take into consideration maybe Morales, uh, you know, didn't have uh, the proper grappling training leading up to this fight with the situation. But again, uh, I need to see how that transpires before I start going against my gut. You know, my gut tells me, and I watch the tape, I think Omar Morales is the better fighter here. Uh, Alexander Hernandez won't have the crowd um, to sway the judge's decision and get him a, a, a crooked, corrupt decision. Um, you know, Alexander Hernandez this is a guy that comes off very cocky. Um, you know, I'm not the biggest fan of his personality. He comes off like that kind of like serious jock, like uh, he takes everything real serious. And, um, you know, I think he might get slept here. We'll have to see how this fight plays out. Uh, I, I think I would like to see Omar Morales get the knockout here. We got a very interesting matchup. Up next, we got Uriah Hall taking on Jacare Souza. Uh, very interesting stylistic matchup. Uh, of course, Jacare Souza has some of the best grappling that we've ever seen uh, take place inside the, inside any cage. Strike Force, UFC. The guy's an ex excellent BJJ practitioner, um, but as of recently, really hasn't used his grappling. You know, he, this guy likes to strike now, constantly going for knockouts. And then, uh, and then you guys know Uriah Hall's forte. This guy's uh, uh, an excellent striker. He has that that home run power. He can end the fight at any time. You know, we've seen him defeat fighters that he probably shouldn't have defeated just by getting that nasty knockout hit, uh, like you know against Gegard Mousasi. Um, and also, how about that knockout that he had in, in the Ultimate Fighter House years ago? Man, I saw that when they aired that fight live. Um, of course, I mean the fight wasn't live, but the first time they aired it. Uh, that Wednesday or whatnot, when he had that spinning heel kick knockout um, against that boxer, man, that guy that had absolutely no no reason to be fighting inside the cage. That guy was not a mixed martial arts fighter. He was a, an amateur boxer, and he tried to make the, the crossover, and uh, that guy had a quick career. But, you know, I had no disrespect to him, but he had no business stepping inside the cage with Uriah Hall, at least I'll say that much. Um, but, yeah, Uriah Hall has some nasty, nasty finishing power. Um, now here's the thing, you know, when I look at this fight, I hope that Jacare doesn't try to make this, you know, a kickboxing striking affair. I would hope that Jacare would use his grappling, you know, make this a grueling fight. You know, we've seen Uriah Hall kind of fade, you know, in, in certain spots, you know, he, he doesn't really like those grueling fights. Um, you know, but I do think that his toughness is underrated. You know, you, you saw Uriah Hall in that Paulo, Paulo Costa fight. That was a fight that, you know, he re really tried to hang in there, but again, he did fade towards the end. You know, Uriah Hall is 35 years old. Um, Jacare Souza is 40 years old. So that is something to take note of too, man. Jacare Souza, 40 years old. Um, you know, but, you know, let me take a look at what Souza has been doing recently. You know, coming off two losses, he tried to move up to a light heavy, the light heavyweight division against John Blakovic, and he lost that split decision. Uh, about, he lost a split decision, decision loss. Um, but, you know, Jan Blakovich, that guy is, you know, pushing for a, a title shot in that division. So maybe no real shame in that loss. The Jack Hermanson fight, I saw that live. And I had Hermanson in, on an underdog spot, man, for those of you guys that remember that. And then before that, you know, he knocked out Chris Weidman uh, in a fight that Chris Weidman had. And then uh, he got knocked out in the third round, which, you know, Chris Weidman to, seems to be doing that as of recently. Hopefully he gets back on track. Um Yes, yeah, so, I mean, how do we see this fight going down? As I stated, I really hope that Jacare can make this somewhat of a mixed martial arts bout, not just a striking affair. If he does that, I think that he could pull this fight off. Uh, the line may be, let's see, what's the line looking like? We got, yeah, the line's kind of where it should be. You know, Souza's around a minus 155. I think that's reasonable. And um, some people like Uriah Hall, you know, in this dog spot. I don't particularly like him here. I like Souza. I think Souza can hold his own on the feet. And then once he make, uses his grappling, goes in for some takedowns, gets your eye hall tired, I could see Souza maybe even getting a submission or just, you know, using his grappling to dominate this fight. So uh, I got Jacare Souza. Moving on to the next fight. Woo! How about this one, man? Imagine when it's fight night and you're sitting on the couch and you're looking up at the TV and you see Francis Ngannou and uh, Jarzino Rosenstruck come out to the octagon and uh, prepare to throw down, man. Just imagine that. Come on, that's going to be a, a hell of a fight, man. The nerves are going to be running. You know someone's getting knocked out in this fight. You know it. Um, I mean, obviously, we, we felt like uh, somebody was going to get knocked out in the Derek Lewis versus Francis Ngannou fight, and nobody did, but I don't see that happening again. Uh, I think Jarzino really brings it, and um, Francis Ngannou has also started to put it together as of recently. I think he got his head back. Uh, and this fight, 
you know, someone's got to get knocked out. Now, remember, this was supposed to headline a uh, UFC fight night card a couple weeks back. So, you know, this fight got saved now. It's it's here. It's going to be taking place April 18th. And, um, you know, you take a look at the line. A lot of people, you know, they're on Francis Ngannou. You know, he's almost a minus 300 right now. You know, minus 260, almost as high, you know, minus 275 on some books. So people are high on him. And I get it. You, you take a look at his Instagram. He's looked ferocious. His boxing's looked crisp. He's definitely been taking the fight game extremely serious. This is a guy, you know, we've seen decapitate Alistair Overeem inside there. Um, you know, completely just ragdoll Junior Dos Santos, chase him from the back and just finish him. Um, this guy, he makes the fighters that step in there with him look like little kids. You know, he looks like he's a, an 18-year-old high schooler and he's fighting, you know, a fifth grader or a sixth grader. The dude's an absolute beast. Um, you know, I still want to see him run it back with Stipe Miocic. I still think that Stipe will have his number anytime they step in there. I think Stipe's fighter IQ is too high for him, along with his grappling. And uh, Stipe is uh, the true heavyweight GOAT, in my opinion. So, um, you know, I would love to see Francis get that rematch. I think he deserves it if he keeps putting in work. Um, but, you know, first and foremost, he's got Rosenstruck in front, in front of him. And this guy, Rosenstruck, is not a fighter to be underestimated or overlooked. This guy, you know, he was losing the fight in his last fight against Alistair Overeem. Uh, and then at the last second, he gets the knockout you know, in the third round, I believe it was. I believe that was a three-round fight. Uh, gets, or might have been a five-round fight. I kind of I forget about that. But uh, gets the knockout at the very end of the fight. I mean, this guy is in it at any point in the fight. He can finish you. Um, completely ripped Overeem's lip apart. I mean, this guy has crazy power. Um, but even besides that, I mean, this guy has just been uh, has been finishing all types of fighters. Everyone that he steps in there with, in there with too. You know, he makes them look like little kids. You know, the finishes that that these guys get, uh, they're just disgusting. You know, the, I mean, Jarzinho. You know, you take a look at his last couple fights. Um, of course, the Overeem fight. You know, he got that victory. The Andre Arlovsky fight. I mean, come on, man. In the first round, just completely. Uh, destroyed Orlovsky in there, put him to sleep. Uh, Alan Crowder, that was ridiculous. I mean, he just like whiffed on him. Crowder tripped and fell down. Then he just went over, stood up above him and just literally just looked like he tapped him in the face and just put him to sleep. It's like he just touched him. Uh, the Junior Albini fight, you guys remember that? You know, and at that point in time, people were sleeping on Rosenstruck. They didn't really know about him. Some people actually had Albini in that fight. Uh, it's kind of funny to look back at fights like that, but... Um, you know, some people I've talked to, they like Rosenstruck here. They like the value on him. Um, I kind of understand it. I mean, there's some value because anybody can be knocked out in this fight. Uh, it's probably going to be a striking battle and someone's going to get slept. I just think that when I see this fight going down, I just see Francis Ngannou winning this fight, period. Um, I didn't like the way that Jarzinho pretty much lost that entire fight against Overeem. You know, so he needs to work on his striking and his output and whatnot. I think that Francis's boxing is more fluid. And then when I see somebody getting knocked out between the two of them, I just see Ngannou knocking Rosenstruck out. I just, I don't know if I could visualize somebody going out there and just putting Ngannou to sleep right now. So that, that leads me to take Ngannou. Um, I would not be touching this fight where the line is. I wouldn't be parlaying it. Uh, it's way too dangerous of a fight to be touching around minus 275. Um, so, but the pick is Francis Ngannou. I'm riding with Francis Ngannou and I'll just take a step back on that fight and enjoy it. So now we make our way up to the main card. Believe it or not, all those fights that we just broke down, all those ridiculous fights, those are preliminary cards. And, uh, and I think they'll be taking place on ESPN. And now we're moving up to the main card, the ESPN Plus pay-per-view uh, part of the card. And it does not get any worse from here. We just got more entertaining fights to look forward to, more ridiculous fights. And uh, yeah, I'm pumped to break these fights down. And even more so, I can't wait to watch these fights transpire. Uh, if you guys could, please subscribe to the channel. It's much appreciated. Help me out over here. Um, subscribe and like, like the video. And also, if you guys could, check me out on Instagram. Please go over to Instagram. Follow my page. It's uh, MMA Fortune Teller underscore. M-M-A-F-O-R-T-U-N-E-T-E-L-L-E-R. You know, the teller. Go follow me on Instagram. I'm always putting out entertaining stuff on the page over there. So, it's much appreciated. So now into this fight here, we got Jeremy Stevens taking on Calvin Cater. Now I knew, I knew Jeremy Stevens had a fight lined up. I knew it. If you guys have been paying attention to Dominic Cruz's and uh, Jeremy Stevens' Instagram, these two dudes have been just straight training together. 
Um, and you could just tell that there was a fight on the horizon. They had something serious brewing. And uh, for those of you guys that know about Dominic Cruz's situation too, he's trying to push to get a fight with Henry Cejudo because uh, it looks like that Aldo fight might be a little bit harder to put together. We'll have to see how that all takes place. Um, but these guys, man, you're talking about two of the best fighters to ever bless the octagon. Two, two amazing fighters. Uh, when you got two guys you know, on a mission like that, putting in work together, there's going to be some great things accomplished. So uh, shout out to both those guys, Jeremy Stevens, and Dominic Cruz, two legends of the game. And, um, and, and they're out there just, you know, sh like straight Spartans putting in work. So uh, Calvin Cater, you know, he's out there doing little, you know, jogging up hills and training with his wife or whatever, sh whoever that lady is. And, um, you know, I hope that he's getting some proper training in because Jeremy Stevens, uh, from the looks of it, is getting uh, – a little bit, a little bit better of the training, but who knows what's really going on beyond behind the scenes? I don't want to judge all that, but I really, it's more of a tip of the hat to Jeremy Stevens and Dominic Cruz. Just, I really admire what they do out there. But you know, we got a hell of a match up here. Jeremy Stevens and Calvin Kadar, uh, both these guys just recently lost to Zabit. Uh, you know, you know, of course, the, um, you know, Calvin Kadar had that fight with Zabit. It was supposed to be a five round fight, got turned into a three round fight, and if it would have been a five round fight, I think that. Uh, Calvin would have won the fight. You know, he really took over that third round, started to look really good in that in that third round. Um, and, you know, and then you take a look at the Jeremy Stevens fight uh, against the beat. It went very, very similarly. Um, you know, he it was a fight, you know, and, and also in the, it's the Yair Rodriguez. You know, Jeremy Stevens started off slow in both those fights. Um, so, you know, these guys could be slow starters. Uh, I, I do feel that these guys mirror each other in a lot of aspects of their game, you know, two solid strikers. They can go to the mat as well. Um, this is a very evenly matched fight in my opinion. Um, but you know, the line doesn't say so. Calvin Cater is coming in as a, a t over a two to one favorite and don't get me wrong. I have Calvin, Calvin to win the fight. Um, but you know, Jeremy Stevens, he can, he can strike with the best of them. Um, but you know, I would have to say that Qatar or Cater's uh, striking is a little bit more fluid and he's a little bit more in his prime. And uh, I do believe it is. It's more of Calvin's time than Jeremy Stevens. Jeremy Stevens, you know, he's he's had his his time for quite some time. You know, he's been in the game for a long time. He's had some crazy victories. You know, from way back, knocking out guys like Rafael dos Anjos way back, and um, you know, took out Josh Emmett. I mean, that was a, an amazing fight. I was there for that live live and watched that fight take place. Um, you know, but he, Jeremy Stevens does tend to lose a lot of fights. Um, you know, some people forget that. You know. He, he kind of has his name for being in these entertaining fights and getting these crazy knockouts, you know, but you take a look at his resume. I mean, if you look at his last 15 fights, I mean, he's barely a 500 fighter. You know, he is getting locked inside the octagon with some of the best fighters, though. You know, Charles Oliveira, Max Holloway, Frankie Edgar, Hanato Moicano, Jose Aldo, Zabit, Yair. I mean, he, he's losing to some of the best fighters, um, but I kind of see this fight taking place similarly to those fights i mean he's gonna get locked in there with one of the best guys in the division and calvin cater and uh calvin's gonna be the guy that gets his arm raised you know calvin's 20 and 4 um, you know should have been a five-round fight against the beat he would have pulled that fight off and then other than that his only loss would against would have been against hanato moicano you know and over over a decade you know of just running through guys um, you know, took out Ricardo Lamas, you know, in that first round in a nasty way, took out Chris Fishgold, uh, Shane Burgos was really the fight that put him on the map. You know, there was a lot of hype behind Shane Burgos. And then he ended up knocking out Shane in the third round after they went to war in that fight, you know, but I, we got to see, you know, Calvin needs to get some, some big names under his belt. So this is his time to do it. You know, getting a victory over Jeremy Stevens will definitely go a long way for him. You know, he could eventually push to get back to, uh, you know, into that title picture. So, uh, definitely has to start stringing off some victories. I'll go with Calvin. I think he's more fluid on the feet. I foresee this fight. I see it taking place on the feet. It's going to be a striking affair. And I think Calvin's a little bit more fluid. Definitely has to watch out for the knockout though. Jeremy Stevens can put anybody to sleep and he could spoil Calvin's night easily. Uh, don't be shocked if that happens, but Calvin Cater to pull this fight off by decision. Vincent Luque taking on Nico Price. Uh, it's great to see Nico Price Get a, a big name, you know, main card fight, man. This guy, Nico Price, I just saw him fight live in his last fight where he had the nasty up kick against James Vick. The fight took place over in Tampa. Uh, took the drive over there solo, man. Had a hell of a time out there. Was running around the arena, just mingling, acting crazy. 
Um, but yeah, Nico Price, man, what a nasty upkick. This guy has the most unorthodox ways of winning fights, man. Uh, of course, you guys remember what he did to Randy Brown, had the hammer fist off bottom and slept him and then turned him around and started uh, following up on him. It was nasty. Uh, this guy, Nico Price, has true finishing power from any any particular position in the fight. Uh, the dude has he's very unorthodox as I stated, and uh, he's a threat to to anyone in there at any any particular time. Uh, the thing is though, Vincent Luque is a very polished striker, trains with some of the best of them. This guy's been putting in work for a long time with some of the best fighters on planet Earth. Uh, you know, Vincent Luque at this point in time, you know, he's been through some wars. You know, he's only 28 years old, but he's been through some real wars. Um, you know, of course, the Mike Perry fight. You know, Mike Perry. Uh, you know, he uh, broke Mike Perry's nose. They went to war, though. Perry landed some nasty shots on him as well. Uh, it was a split decision victory for Vincent, but I thought Vincent easily won that fight. Um, and then after that, he did lose to Stephen Thompson. Stephen Thompson's just, you know, such an underrated fighter. He can go in there and make the best of fighters look like clowns. I mean, you saw what he did to Jorge Masvidal on the feet, uh, Vincent Luque. Uh, shout out to Stephen Thompson. Um, you know, this is a fight... I think it's pretty pretty simple in my mind. I think that as long as Vincent Luque avoids that nasty knockout from Nico, you know that that crazy unorth unorthodox type of, type of knockout, um, doesn't even have to be unorthodox. Actually, it could even be just an overhand hook, something crazy that Nico wings out there. Um, I think he wins the fight. I think that Nico is just not the most polished fighter with his striking. I think it's it's uh, it's wild, and if Vincent just plays it safe. And uh, he avoids that big shot, keeps his guard up. I think he cruises into a unanimous decision victory. Up next, we got all your guys' favorite fighter, Greg, the Prince of War Hardy, taking on Jorgen de Castro. And of course, I say that joking around. I know a lot of you guys cannot stand Greg Hardy. I see the comments. Um, you know, this guy, a lot of people judge him for his... Uh, his whole background, the story of his domestic violence and all that. But, uh, you know, there's one thing you guys cannot deny. This guy is an athletic freak. And um, he's definitely been cruising through the UFC, um, you know, a lot quicker than a lot of guys would with the amount of experience that he has. Now, he is coming off a loss against Alexander Volkov, but don't get it twisted. Alexander Volkov is on a whole nother level. This guy is a career mixed martial artist with a, a freaky frame. And, uh, you know, that was a, a ridiculous match where people really underestimated Volkov. Um, you know, Volkov wins that fight all day, any day. So, um, but before that, you know, the Ben Sosely fight, it was a fight that he won, but then it got turned over to a no contest because he used the asthma spray. But that was a fight that he really didn't look that impressive in. He was backpedaling the entire time. Uh, there were some rumors that he broke his hand in that fight. Um, so, you know, that was what it was. And then the fight before that against my boy, Big Juan Adams. You guys remember Big Juan. You know, he's trying to make his way back into the octagon, man. Cool dude. Um, we've talked about doing an interview together. We'll probably get that interview done, you know, when he's making his return to the UFC. We'll get that hype going and whatnot. Um, but that was a fight, you know, uh, Juan got finished early. He made the mistake of rushing in and Greg Hardy definitely has finishing power. Um, but you know, so, you know, this guy, Jorgen de Castro that, you know, Greg Hardy is going to be taking on. This guy is absolutely no joke. Uh, we saw him make his debut on Dana White's contender series. This guy has since made his UFC debut, uh, inside the octagon and got the nasty finish against Justin Taffa. This guy is uh, undefeated. He's what at this point, six and zero. Um, and, uh, I hate to say it, you know, um, I guess a lot of you want to hear it. I think that Jorgen de, de Castro is going to win this fight. I think he's, uh, he's been training mixed martial arts for a longer period of time than Greg Hardy. Um, this is a, he's a more, he's a real mixed martial artist. Whereas Greg Hardy at this point in time is more of the, just the athlete that's slowly, uh, he's learning all this, you know, this, the mixed martial arts game. So, um, and Jorgen de Castro, I, I think that people underestimate him for his body. You know, he's a little bit overweight. I would like to see him slow down on the rice and beans. Um, I think if he got a little bit more shredded and he had a better diet, I think this guy could be a real threat in the division. But there's one thing that you cannot deny is that this guy has finishing power. Um, his leg kicks are nasty. If you remember the fight against Alton Meeks, his, his leg kicks were nasty. I mean, he just, he took out Alton's legs right away and that was it. Um, expect De Castro to work Greg Hardy's legs from the beginning. I, I foresee Greg Hardy circling and, and being on his back foot and, and circling kind of retreating in this bout. Uh, I don't really think that Greg Hardy is going to want it with De Castro as far as uh, engaging with the hands and somebody getting knocked out. Um, 
we've seen Greg Hardy kind of second guess himself. And Greg, or another asterisk you got to keep in mind is Greg Hardy has shown to have issues with his breathing. Um, you know, he saw him run to his asthma spray. That's an X factor, man. You know, if um, that's a mental thing too. You know, you start to feel like you're having an asthma attack in there. You're not going to want to engage as much. Um, so as far as you know, throwing money on a guy in Greg Hardy with two to what being a two to one favorite in that spot, I don't think it's worth it. Um, I would stay away from it. I think the value is on De Castro. I think at the very least, bit this is a fight that's fifty fifty. So. Um, you know, mark my words though, expect DeCastro to work the legs of Greg Hardy. He could also even get a knockout. He can, you know, anybody can get knocked out in this fight. These guys are giant human beings that have nasty power. Um, you know, we'll see if Greg Hardy takes that next step, you know, if he's able to, to, uh, to rebound off that tough, tough loss. And really, I would say even two tough losses because that Sausalee fight was an L for him. He was supposed to go in there. He was supposed to handle business and he did not rise to the occasion. So let's see if all the training at American Top Team and uh, and being around all the guys that he's around, let's see if it starts to elevate his game, and uh, he can come here, come in here April eighteenth, and and bounce back with the victory. But I got the underdog, another underdog play from the teller, um, not a play, but an underdog pick. So uh, I don't want to hear nothing about me only picking favorites. That's another under underdog pick, and Jorgen De Castro. We've made it to the co-main event of the card, and it's a rematch that a lot of you guys wanted to see. I know I did at least. Jessica Andrade taking on Rose Nama Yunus. I think it's a perfect matchup, uh, especially uh, with everything that's transpired. You know, Jessica Andrade losing the belt, getting knocked out by Zhang, and uh, and now Rose Nama Yunus, you know, gets a chance to rebound and uh, get a victory against uh, Jessica Andrade after Jessica Andrade picked her up and slammed her on her head, knocking her out. Um, I'm sure you guys remember that bout. I thought it was one of the most exciting women's mixed martial arts, arts bouts I've ever seen. Uh, you know, Rose Nama Yunus, let's not, un let's not forget and underestimate her, man. She was absolutely dominating Jessica Andrade in that fight, picking her apart. Uh, the striking was looking so nasty, so fluid. She was using her reach advantage. And then Andrade picked her up. Uh, for some reason, Rose decided to try to hold on to that Kimura for so long. I don't understand why she did that. Uh, definitely a bad decision, and uh, Andrade used her powers to slam her and finish her. Um, so, you know, in my opinion, this fight is it's pretty pretty easy to break down. In my opinion, if Andrade doesn't get the finish, if she doesn't get the knock knockout in whatever way she does, whether it's a hook with her hands, another slam, some type of ground and pound knockout, um, I don't see her winning this fight. I see Rose winning this fight all day. We saw how this fight took place before the finish. Rose is on a completely another level in regards to her striking. Um, I truly believe that Rose is going to make a push to, to win the belt. I think as, as long as she avoids getting knocked out, there's not a lot of girls that could hang with her on the feet. Uh, you know, she's been putting in work with her fiance, husband, boyfriend, whatever he is, Pat Berry, for a long time now. Pat Berry being in a, uh, one of the one of the best strikers that ever walked the planet, you know, a K1 kickboxer. This guy, you know, he's had wars with Mirko Krokop inside the octagon. I mean, there's not a lot of guys that are his size that are as fluid on the feet as he is. And uh, and Rose has slowly learned all those skills. And uh, expect Rose Namajunas to pull this finish, pull the finish off, uh, or at least get the victory. I think that she has a good chance to pull the finish off as well, though. Uh, Jessica Andrade just got knocked out by Zhang, so her chin has been tested as of recently. Rose Namajunas is going to be landing a lot of shots on her, and uh, it's going to be tough for Andrade to, uh, to to sit there and eat all those punches for three rounds. So I got Rose Namajunas to win this fight, and then eventually um, she's going to get the title shot You know, after this, this victory that she gets on April 18th. So definitely excited for that bout. Now, before we get into this main event, as I stated earlier, the teller has won 10 of his last 11 plays. Do not sleep on what I bring to the table. You guys do not hesitate to reach out to me to sign up for my exclusive picks. You know, comment below uh, if you guys are interested or, you know, the best way to get a hold of me through Instagram, DM me. Like I said, though, if you do not have Instagram, my email is MMAFortuneTeller at gmail.com or comment below one way or another. Let's get it done. Let's work together and let's make some great money. I've had nothing but time to put in on this fight card. It will be a very, very profitable card. So we made it to the main event. In my opinion, on paper, one of the most exciting matchups we've ever had. Um, you know, I said it and I'll say it again. You tell me when we had two guys locked inside the octagon that have a resume 
that's more exciting than these two fighters. Every time they step inside the octagon, it's an exciting fight. Every time they step into the octagon, they bring it. They never retreat. Uh, their, their cardio, their pace is second to none. Um, you know, Tony Ferguson, he's been training for Khabib for this fight. Uh, you know that he's in a whole nother place as far as his mental goes. This guy's been training for a war against the pound for pound best fighter uh, on planet Earth, in my opinion, in Khabib. Um, and now he's fighting a guy in Justin Gaethje that's, you know, he's almost on that same level. Uh, there's some differences in Justin Gaethje and Khabib that I'm going to go into and uh, kind of makes the fight a little bit different. But uh, nevertheless, it's a very high caliber opponent. You know, Tony Ferguson, you know, was a guy that I could not stand, you know, uh, when he was on the Ultimate Fighter, the Ultimate Fighter show, you know, he was bringing up personal stuff against these guys, talking about these guys' kids and whatnot. You know, I don't play that shit. I don't like that. Uh, ever since that show, I've wanted nothing less than to see him get knocked unconscious every time he stepped in there. Um, but then he started to grow on me because he's just so crazy and he started to understand that he's not just a typical guy that was you know, on the show talking shit and whatnot. This is a guy that is a complete lunatic. He really is. And, uh, and you mix that with alcohol. Uh, for people that have life experience and if you've ever been around guys like that, it's you can't blame the guy. The guy's just not all there. The guy's a complete loony. And uh, since then, it's all came out. You know, the guy has had mental issues and and uh, and his mental issues kind of transpire to him being an amazing uh, fighter, an amazing mixed martial artist. The guy is just, uh, he's obsessed with training and he trains in all these unorthodox ways. His cardio is crazy. Um, he doesn't fear any man. He's going to step inside the octagon. He's going to try to walk you down and uh, and he's going to, he's never going to gas out and he's going to be, uh, you know, a hundred miles per hour from the, from the, be the time the bell rings in the first round all the way to the final uh, bell in the, the end of the fifth round. So you know that he'll never gas out. Um, now he does have some holes in his game. He leaves his chin up there. I don't like that. And, uh, and I'll tell you the difference between this fight and the Khabib fight was I didn't think Khabib was as much as a threat to knock him out on the feet. I think he did have that threat a little bit, but not as much as Justin Gaethje. Justin Gaethje is coming off three victories where he's used his hands. Uh, he's been just completely just sleeping guys with his hands. Uh, I think that his boxing is very much underrated, and Tony's going to give him a lot of opportunities to knock him out. So, um, you know, I'm going to make a pick right now live here. I've been back and forth, and I'm going to make a pick here towards the end of this uh, breakdown just on the spot because I've been bouncing back and forth, you know, for a couple different reasons, but I want to go into them first. Um, you know, but so as I stated, Justin Gaethje, uh, you know, just defeated Donald Cerrone with the uh, with just nasty fuck, uh, nasty uppercuts. Finished him in the first round. Edson Barbosa with the nasty hook. You know, cut the cage off and set set the hook up. And then the James Vick fight, just same thing. You know, walked him down, cut the cage off, and knocked him out. Um, so J Justin Gaethje's boxing is is really you know, really, really um, has accelerated over, you know, the last couple of years training at Elevation Fight Team. Uh, you know, his head coach is a, an excellent striking coach. And, um, you know, now he goes into a fight with Tony Ferguson where he's going to get an opportunity to get the knockout. Um, so initially, I was really on Justin Gaethje. I thought that this was an excellent matchup for him. He could push the pace. He has wrestling uh, to go, you know, to to challenge Tony Ferguson if Tony Ferguson wants to make it a grappling affair. Uh, I thought he could control uh, Tony Ferguson or, so, you know, somewhat control him. Of course, you know, Tony Ferguson's very unorthodox and he'll be throwing elbows. Um, but the thing that's kind of made me take a step back uh, on just picking Justin Gaethje is if you saw the interview uh, with him on ESPN, you know, he he's, seems like he's kind of second guessing himself. You know, if you know how to read fighters, you know, any fighter that says he's not 100%, he's saying he's 95% or 90%. And uh, he's been scared at times, make, you know, going into this fight. Uh, I think he's second guessing himself. He's talked about the reason why he's been is scared is because if your cardio is not fully up to the test, you know, you can put yourself at risk, you know, to take brain damage and whatnot. I don't like those types of remarks. I definitely feel that he's shown uh, to be second guessing himself and he tries to make it come off like he's just being really transparent and just a cool dude, but he, he's showing some, some chinks in his armor. I can tell you for sure, Tony Ferguson is not second guessing himself in the least bit. He thinks he's going to go in there and absolutely butcher Justin Gaethje and finish him. There's not even uh, a second where he second guesses himself. And, and for that reason, I, I think I'm going to pick Tony Ferguson. 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick Tony Ferguson. Tony Ferguson has been training nonstop for Khabib. His cardio is going to be better, in my opinion, because Justin Gaethje's already admitted that his cardio won't be as good as it would have been uh, if he was really training for the fight, which I, I don't understand. You know, Justin Gaethje has the same management as Khabib. There's been a good amount of time that he's known that Khabib wasn't going to take this fight. I think he knew he was going to get a big name fight. And, uh, and he said that he's been training with a lot of his partners that had fights as of recently. Um, I just don't like how he second guessed himself though. So for that, I'm going to pick Tony Ferguson, but I was initially on Justin Gaethje. I had Justin Gaethje winning this fight and I still think he very easily could win this fight. I think that he can get the knockout, um, you know, with his hands. I think that Tony Ferguson's going to walk forward and give Justin the chance to clip him and finish him. Um, but now I kind of feel that Justin Gaethje can land some shots, but I think Tony, I think he'll survive. Even if he gets tagged, I think he'll, he'll, you know, he'll roll around, he'll do his unorthodox stuff to survive. And then once it hits the fourth and fifth rounds, I think that Tony Ferguson's going to push the pace and take over the fight. Um, you know, Justin Gaethje even said it. He said, if I lose this fight, I'm going to lose it in the fourth or fifth round. I'll start to gas out and Ferguson will, will butcher me up and then pull off the submission. When I hear a fighter say that, I can no longer pick him to win the fight. So that's why I got Tony El Kukui Ferguson to win the fight. So that's going to sum up UFC 249. Very excited for this event to take place. Also, a quick note, I am probably going to be doing a live stream for the card. Uh, so I'll be doing a live stream on my YouTube. So make sure you guys take note of that. If you guys want to join me for the fights, um, we'll have things going. I'm still trying to work that out or see if I'm going to do that. But uh, you know, keep in contact. Hit me up on Instagram, comment, and uh, we'll mingle. We'll figure things out. And uh, you guys all stay safe out there. And uh, just, you know, we only got a couple more days, right? We got what? About uh, what, 10 more days or whatnot. A couple more days. Uh, and we'll have some fights to watch. So things will be, things will be good on uh, April the 18th. On MMA. Fortune. Until then, the teller. The teller. The teller. The teller.